Management of Agreements. Um, I will be turning things over to our panel members in, in just a moment, but sort of to summarize the day, I thought I would go through sort of conceptually transformative agreements. But before I do that, this will be very brief because you've already heard a lot of information from um, the colleagues who've, speak, who've spoken already today. But um, just conceptually, let me give you a, a little bit more information about um, who I am and why I'm here speaking to you. So I'm Colleen Campbell from the Open Access 2020 Initiative. All right, yes, Open Access 2020 Initiative. Um, you'll see there just you know, some of the organizations that have signed the OA 2020 Expression of Interest. To remind you, this is an initiative that is a global initiative aimed at accelerating the transition to open access. We have seen that after you know, 20 years that we have been trying to promote open access to our researchers and in a way sort of pushing them to change their behavior, we needed to do something more. We needed to expand our strategies to think about um, our own investments as institutions and libraries in the paywall system. So um, what we have created, again, it was mentioned before at one of the Berlin conferences a couple years ago was this expression of interest in the large scale implementation of open access to scholarly journals. Um, Jeff referenced it before. The idea is not only do we need to invest in new infrastructure for open access dissemination of research results, not only do we invest in new open access journals, do we invest in, in our repositories, but we also need to think about the money that we are spending. So if we take um, the journals that exist today, the journals that our researchers know and love and participate in on editorial boards and in peer review, if we take those journals, and transition them to open access, we would get that much closer to our goal of, of open access, open science on truly a large scale. Perhaps you've seen this slide before, but to remind us again, there is already enough money in the system. We know that the, the, on a global scale, the 7.6 billion euro that we spend every year in subscription journals is amply sufficient to publish those same journals open access. And we heard today from Martin um, about you know, the, the true costs involved in publishing open access. So if we know the money is there to transition those journals, the next step is to think about, okay, what can we do with the money that we are spending to take them from the subscription system and move them over so that th those funds are supporting open access publishing. Um, this is let me see, uh, an image of the Berlin Open Access Conference of last um, December. And there, it was really a, a very strong moment. So after we launched the initiative Open Access 2020, just a couple years ago, already um, we had a panel of um, representatives from um, truly global representatives. You see here Professor Ahmed Bawa, CEO of um, you know, you, USAF, thank you, that's the correct term, um, was sat on this panel as well, in which institutions from around the world said to the CEOs of the three largest publishers, and there you see the CEO of Elsevier at the time, who received the message, we, and this community of global research organizations, we are committed to our authors retaining their copyrights, we are committed to complete and immediate open access, and we're committed to accelerating the transition through transformative agreements. And we've heard a little bit about them today and we'll hear more about the deal agreement in just a moment. Um, but I think one of the other significant points that I'd like to mention here about this message that we transmitted is that we had um, the research community, you know, so research institutions, universities, but also the funding community present and the research community present themselves, so faculty themselves, communicating this um, to the publishers in, in agreement, in alignment, because, you know, we, we've talked in the past about, well, there must be a green road or there must be a diamond road or, you know, the gold road, but we are at a moment, you know, we, 
we are we are advancing all together and we are at a moment in time where we can all all of these roads are coming together toward one objective complete and immediate open access so um transformative agreements just to remind ourselves what they are. There is not one model of a transformative agreement yet. We're in a moment of transition. So basically the, the, the concept behind them is changing the underlying business model. And there's a lot of experimentation that, have ha that has happened over the past few years. And we are trying to, you know, through initiatives like this and through others that we will talk about more tomorrow, um, to share our experiences and um, the models that are being adopted. We heard about one model um, that is being you know, proposed at University of California, but there's not just one model, right? We're still working, we're still figuring this out. And I think it's important that in every context, um, we think about what is the model that is going to work for us. So I'm, I'm going to sort of walk you through very briefly the, the concept that we have um, at least in, you know, generally for transformative agreements. And the, the idea is we need to get oversight into the cost of scholarly communication. So bringing the, the subscription element and the open access publishing element together in an integrated way, consolidated way under one agreement. So we, can, we have oversight, we know how much is being spent and we can um, somehow you know, govern that. Then the next, conceptually, in transitional transformative agreements, we convert the funds that are spent into open access publishing funds. And I mean, we, we call them that. The money that we are going to give is money for open access publishing primarily. You know, you, we'll hear about the, the, the German deal agreement. There we call it a publish and read agreement. Others call it a read and publish. Indeed, as Jeff said, these are just um, terms. The concept is the focus is and the money is formally shifted to support open access publishing. Then with that comes, of course, this um, shift in workflows. So we're no longer talking about, you know, paying one invoice for a year, theoretically, I and mean, this is the, the where we are going. We're not talking about one renewal invoice. We are going to start looking at things at an article level. So right down to the actual services that we are receiving right with these agreements and this is an important step because it allows us to think about shifting our workflows and what we are paying for down to the individual article level we are of course paying somewhat of a reading fee now because not everything even under the deal agreement not everything we still have to have access to the content behind the paywall but we are going to work, to work toward a moment in which the reading fee will go away. And we want to only pay for publishing services. And this is the key. Do you see we've had this, you know, this, this agreement that has sort of the walls have gone away and we are now talking about paying for publishing services at the article level. And that's going to give us the cost transparency that we need. And you know, putting that focus on the publishing services that that's where we want to be, transparency in publishing services. Um, right now, I don't know if you do public tenders in, in, in South Africa for, for services, right? Right now, we have this lack of transparency. We have to renew every year, um, right? But publishers have unique journal portfolios, so it's difficult for their, to, you, know, you can't really do a comparison of these two things, you need them all. But if we can move into a world in which we are paying for services, there we can have ele you know, new elements of competition that come into play. Also, at that point, the funds no longer locked up into one big renewal package, but being attributed and transacted at the article level would allow a moment in which the funds are free to follow the authors based on where the authors want to publish, based on their own disciplinary needs. That is where we might have the preconditions for innovation and diversity in scholarly communication because maybe there are some disciplines where the journal no longer needs to exist. You know, we might even see that in the not too distant future. But for the moment, in order to get to that point, we have to find a way of unlocking that big subscription spend. 
And this is what transformative agreements aim to do. I just want to mention the synergy with the objectives of Plan S. And of course, you know, some, some researchers might have, um, might have felt the Plan S principles as a little bit of an imposition or, or um, on, their, you know, on their research practices. But I think actually Plan S or, or institutions can see Plan S as a way of, you know, of um, uh, a further motivation for transformative agreements. If we want to give our authors the maximum choice in publishing venue also under and be compliant with the Plan S principles, transformative agreements are a way to do this, in addition to open access platforms and repositories. We saw before, publishers are beginning to embrace this transition. These are the publishers that today have some form of transformational agreement in place. So they are there and are beginning to work more broadly. And the momentum of transformative agreements is spreading globally. So it's no longer just something of you know, the Nordic countries or Germany, right? After you see a few, just a, a few, after the, the Netherlands, UK, Sweden, Germany, but also even smaller countries like Spain, Greece, Hungary, where there are not you know, large amounts of money going into the universities and as well in the US, which is extremely important, of course, as we're trying to get global momentum behind this. So now, just to, that was sort of an overview of, of uh, who we are at OA 2020 and what we are trying to achieve all together. Um, I would like to now turn things over to my panel. I've prepared a few questions because we're going to be anal analyzing the largest transformative agreement negotiated so far, the deal agreement in Germany. And so I'm going to introduce, you, you see him now, um, Gerard Meyer. So Gerard, is your, is your sound back on now? Yes, my sound is back on. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you just fine. So to begin this panel, um, Gerard will give a brief introduction because he was Gerard Meyer, um, Fritz Haber, he's the director of the Fritz Haber Institute, which is part of the Max Planck Society in Berlin. And he was um, one of the key members of the negotiating team for Project Deal. And now I shall, okay, I shall um, turn things over to Gerard. So thank, you. thank you very much. I, I hope you can all hear me well. If not, please let me know. Um, I might repeat some things that have already been said because I just heard the introduction from Colleen. I don't know what, um, what others have maybe mentioned before, but, that, but that's the way it is. Um, I would like to give you an update on the status of the deal negotiations in, the, in Germany in general and, and on the contract with, um, with Wiley in particular. And so maybe you can show this first slide, which um, has as a header deal, where um, deal actually the abbreviation is a German abbreviation. It it stands for Deutsche Allianz Lizenz. So it is it is the licenses for the German alliance, and this is the German alliance of research organizations. So there in Germany, it's not only the universities that are involved in this. Many universities, universities of applied science but also the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, Leibniz, Helmholtz, and the Max Planck Gesellschaft, as well as the funding organization. So it's, a, it's really the alliance of all the organizations that have something to do with research in Germany. And all these organizations, they signed, for instance, the Berlin Declaration in 2003, the Berlin Declaration on Open Access, and they also have all joined the OA 2020 initiative that Colleen just, uh, just talked about. And um, this, this alliance got together and said, we, if we really want to make a transition to open access and, um, and we want to mo have more transparent pricing, we want to negotiate national licenses first and for all with the three major publishers. So DEAL really focuses on nationwide national licenses for Germany with the three major publishers being Springer Nature, Wiley and Elsevier. And basically with all these three publishers, we started negotiating and we, we demanded or asked from them the same. And um, what, we, what we wanted from them is what we call an, a publish and read model, as you just mentioned. So first we want nationwide uh, licenses to the entire portfolio of electronic journals. That is reading access to everything that's being published like you normally have with the subscriptions as well. But in addition to that, we want all publications 
by corresponding authors of eligible institutions. So all institutions that are part of this alliance, which is basically all research institutions and organizations in Germany. Uh, we want all these publications to become open access immediately upon publication, where uh, kind of as a default, we would like to have a CCBY license. We also demanded um, fair pricing. So fair pricing ultimately only based as you also just described on the number of papers published and Colleen also mentioned that is, that is in no way uh, something that, that, that is special for Germany. This, this strategy is really aligned with approaches in, in neighboring countries and not only neighboring countries in, in Western Europe, but, but all over the world. Um, so, so this is basically what we demanded from each of these uh, publishers. Maybe you can switch to the next slide, uh, Colleen. Okay. And um, so on the, on the next slide, I just wanted to give an, a kind of a very simplistic or simplified overview of where we were in the past and where we want to go to in the future. Um, when we talk with the publishers, we mainly discuss the so-called hybrid journals. So that is the journals that, um, on, that, you, in, that you can choose to, to, um, to publish open access in, right? Um, so, the, so, we, so the, we mainly, so this is 90% of what, what we talk about, the hybrid subscription journals. For those articles, for those journals, it used to be in the subscription era, I would like to say, um, that the cost that we paid per article is 3,800 euros per article. This is the number that Colleen just mentioned based on the 7.6 billion euro that is spent worldwide and given that there are 2 million articles uh, per year kind of published, right? So of course in the old days, in the subscription era, you never calculated the price per article. But this was the actual income generated by the publishers um, for, for their publication work. In the end, so you see this timeline there on the left-hand side. So in the old days, I would say we paid subscription fees for reading access. We paid about 3,800 euros per article. We want to go to a situation that's at the bottom where we pay for open access publishing of all articles and no more than that when everything is open access. But we are right now in this transition phase. And in this transition phase, to put it very simplified, what happened is when authors demanded that their articles would be published open access. There were quite a number of publishers that said, well, fine, we'll publish your article open access. Um, it will cost you kind of 3,000 euro extra. And effectively, the publishers got 6,800 euros per article or something like that. And this is what was in the jargon known as double dipping. So there were different models to circumvent that. So a better thing was that if you pay subscription fees, you get credits for a certain number of APCs. So at least that you avoid this double dipping, um, but then you're basically back again to, to, um, to the price of 3,800 euros per article in these offsetting models. And what we really want to, want to reach, we really want to, we do want to pay for publishing. We do want to pay for the cost associated with publishing. We realize that not everything is available free to read. So we do realize there is some component for reading in there as well, but we need to find a fair price for that. And that you need to negotiate with the publishers individually and with Wiley, we agreed on a so-called publish and read fee for publication of articles in hybrid journals of 2,750 euros per article. And you see we're on the way from where we were in the past to where we hope to end up in the further future. In addition, in the negotiations, we also talk about the pure open access journals. We don't want to forget those. Those were actually leading the way. And for those, we, um, we agreed or we negotiated on national discounts on, um, on the standard APCs. Maybe you can move to the next slide, um, Colleen, which is the last one. So this is just the details of the three-year contract that was made in Germany. It was signed in the, in the middle of January. So it's a nationwide publish and read agreement. And the main thing is that it, it is um, open access publishing of an uncapped number of articles in Wiley hybrid and pure gold open access journals by the corresponding authors of institutions that are affiliated with DEAL. And again, that basically covers all the research institutions and, and organizations in Germany. 
the authors do no longer have to individually pay for that. So the publishing fees are paid centrally and they're really calculated. So, so Wiley sends one bill annually to Germany and that bill is just a number of articles times 2,750 uh, per article. And so the exact counting of the number of articles is very important. Um, we agreed on this, on this par fee as we call it uh, for the period of this three-year contract with no annual increase. And as I said, we also made an agreement for the pure gold open access journals and in that we get a 20% discount on the list price APC. Important, the copyrights stay with the authors. They have a complete freedom of choice in license. This is also important in the, in the political era, arena in, in Germany, uh, but CC BY is proposed by default. But of course, if an author wants a different license and good reasons to want a different license, the author has the free choice. Also, if an author chooses to not publish open access, we would not understand why an author would do this. But if an author would choose not to publish open access, uh, they can choose to do so. We will still pay the 2,750 euros for that article to Wiley though, because the publication costs are dear. Um, in addition to, to this access, we also have, or in addition to this, we have read access and, and permanent access uh, to all Wiley on journal Wiley online journal content, including back files. So back to 1997, which we actually can host on a, on a so-called dark archive uh, server in, in Germany. So, this, so some organizations already had all these back files, but because this is a nationwide contract where different organizations had different contracts in the past, it was important to cover everybody. And um, as Colleen said, in the past, I mean, there was a lot of things were unknown about the contracts that were made in the different countries. And every country signed their own non-disclosure agreement and was told that we probably had the best agreement of all countries anyway, so we shouldn't ask further questions. Um, we wanted that, that from the beginning, we stated that, and we'll also do that with the other publishers, we want the contract to be completely transparent and open as well. So the agreement as such is, is published and for everybody available. And um, so this is, with, with Wiley, we reached an agreement. We're in constructive negotiations with Springer Nature um, and with Elsevier, it's very difficult. That's my update so far. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for a few moments of questions before I actually move into the panel itself? Okay, does anyone have any um, questions specifically about the deal agreement? So the question is, how is a nationwide agreement defined? How is a nationwide agreement defined? Um, so, so basically, it is an, um, it is an agreement um, that is the same for for all organizations in the country that, that would like to participate in this, right? So, so basically the Alliance of Research Organizations says, try to negotiate as good as you can for all Germany. And then in the end, it is the individual universities and, um, and, and research organizations that sign up to this contract or not, right? But, but actually Wiley, um, for instance, in this case, they do not negotiate any individual contracts with all the other individual universities. So, so it's the same contract for all participants, for all academic institutions in, in Germany. That's what meant with it. It is still up to those institutions to decide whether they want to, to be part of that, um, yes or no. Um, we already, but we said we are willing to pay 2,750 euros per article published from Germany that is where the corresponding author is affiliated with one of the German institutions. Um, actually, whether there is a contract um, or not, because the, the cost for publishing is dear. And so it's in, in, in a way very important to keep, to keep everything close. To, to, it is important to, to indeed have as many institutions and, and um, the best would be all institutions in Germany indeed sign up for that. And with Wiley, that looks actually extremely good. So it's, it's a deal that is much better than any individual institution would have been able to negotiate for themselves. And um, so basically they get, and it's a cost neutral transition more or less. So it doesn't cost them more than in the past, but for that they get all publications open access at no extra cost for the authors. They get access to, 
much more um, content and they get access to all the back files. So I think it's, it's really, it's, it's really only, only positive for all the institutions involved. I'm, I'm gonna ask another question that was actually posed before. Um, and you, you kind of mentioned this already, Gerard, but um, if we heard before from uh, Martin Rasmussen from Copernicus that you know, their costs are around um, 1,400 euro to publish an article. We heard from scope three that the cost is around 1,100. And yet this agreement has set a par fee of 2,750. Can you, can you talk about how those figures relate? Yes, yeah, so, so we also, I, you saw this in one of my slides that I showed, we also think and hope that in the future uh, when, when everything is, is open access, the price might go um, further down. Um, this, this price, I mean, so in the end, the only realistic way to make these contracts on a national level with the major publisher is when it is more or less cost neutral. And so, so basically, this is, this is how this, this contract is being made. Um, we knew what Germany as a whole, the different libraries of the different institutions paid in the past, we knew how many articles are annually published with corresponding authors from Germany, and we basically divided these two numbers um, to, to come up with this. And, um, and then you can negotiate a few percent here and there. Um, and so, but you see that with this price where you, we have to realize that we come, and, and this is difficult to believe for many people, but this number is right. We come from a price of 3,800 euros per article. And, um, and so I think we made a very important step in the right direction um, with with a lot of plus things, positive things. The positive things being that everything is open access available immediately, that the copyrights stay with the authors. In addition, that there is this absolute transparency on how actually that what the publishers earn is going to be calculated. It just depends on it. So, so it has all these positive things, but yes, we're not there yet. And um, yes, I still think it is expensive, but you have to also in these negotiations um, in the end, be realistic. What, what can be done and what you can do from both sides. I do realize that also for the publishers, this is a major change. They, they basically in the past, they had the addresses of the libraries where they sent the annual bill to for the subscription fees. Now they have to count each individual article and track where this article comes from. And if this article is written by an author that belongs to one of the institutions that's affiliated with it. And so also from their side, lots of things need to be set up. Lots of workflow needs to change. And this is, this is the compromise solution clearly that we came up with in the negotiations with my Okay. I'm going to um, sort of turn things over a bit now. Did you have any, anything else you wanted to say about sort of like the significance of this agreement in Germany or, or are you set? Well, I mean, so, so in, in a way, I mean, there are other countries, Austria had, um, had, had good open access agreements, um, the Netherlands had, had good open access agreements. In a way, this is not so completely different. The, the, what is different is that it is, um, Germany is just a bigger country. It just has a bigger share of the, of the world market. It's about 5%. It is very visible. And, um, and, and this, is, this is a contract where really, the, the, the calculation is really done um, on a per article basis. And it's also important that, and I think there are not many of those, where the article number is uncapped. And um, of course, this is, this is a risk on the side of academia, you could say, because it can be more expensive. We feel this is, this is, a, this is a, a risk we can take. I mean, we're willing to pay for the cost of publication, right? And this is also kind of a chance, of course, that a publisher sees to, uh, to, to grow their income when indeed more people will choose to, to publish with Wiley. I mean, in the past, when people wanted to publish with Wiley and they wanted to publish open access, they often had to pay out of their own pocket, out of their own research budget, the, the additional cost. And now it's all centrally covered. So I, I do think, and we will learn about this, but I do think this will lead to, to a slightly changing publishing behavior of the researchers in selecting in which journals they will publish. Okay, thank you. So now I'm, I would like, we have um, here on our panel, we also have Liz Ferguson, um, who is leading open access at um, the publisher Wiley, when she was involved in, 
in, in setting up this, this agreement as well. So Liz, why don't you, I would like you to share your perspective on the significance of this, of this agreement. Okay, thanks Colleen, um, and thanks for Gerard for the introduction. It means I don't have to talk about too many of the technicalities of the agreement. But as Ben said, if you've already cornered him and there are more people who want to know more technicalities, we're here for the next couple of days. Um, this deal was hugely significant for Wiley for any number of reasons. Um, one of them was that we were the first to get to agreement with Deal in Germany. I don't think many people in this room or possibly elsewhere would have anticipated that being the case. Um, ben has described some of how we got there when he talked earlier, but I think what this really reflected was this very significant decision we took when we realized we were at a fork in the road with our negotiations with Deal. It coincided with the arrival of a couple of key people at Wiley, one of whom was Judy Versus, who looks after our journals business overall, and the other of whom was our CEO, Brian Napak. And when the questioner asked um, earlier whether Wiley really had any choice, we absolutely did. We spent months and months and months pouring over this fork and whether we chose to dig in our heels, stick to our 200 years of history, or whether we chose to reflect on the fact that what our customers were asking us for was a fundamentally different thing, but that they were asking for that because we had reached a position where there was a divide between what we were prepared to deliver and what the market, the customers, the researchers wanted to receive from publishers. Now, the discussion that we had internally and the decision we made about proceeding with Deal went right to the very top of Wiley. It was reviewed extensively and endorsed by our board of directors. Brian was involved personally in a lot of the negotiations. So don't underestimate in any way the significance of the decision we, we took to proceed with this. There are compromises in the agreement for us as well as there are for Deal, for example. But the fundamental tipping point for us came when we realized that we could actually share what Deal's desired endpoint was, and that was a future of 100% open access for Germany. And then everything began to change from that point. From that point on, we were talking about having the same goal, and the discussion became one more of how we got there rather than where it was we were trying to go. And at that stage, I think a new level of trust and partnership came into the relationship. We still had a lot of ground to build, and it took us quite a few more months from that point to get there, but that was where the conversation changed. Um, ben used the word adversarial relating to other discussions earlier on, with Deal, we found that we could sit down and have a meaningful conversation once we could agree on our, our shared goals. And the partnership component is one that is really significant in all of this. Wiley is the world's biggest society publisher, as many of you will know. Martin spoke um, very eloquently earlier about the importance of societies in his world. They are hugely important to us as well. We chose to enter deal without consulting with our partner societies. Uh, that wasn't an easy decision for us to make either, but I think if we tried to do so with 600 plus different organizations, we would have ended up with very conflicting opinions about what we should do. We made the decision to go in on their behalf as well as on our own, and the response we got on the day that we announced deal was universally positive. The societies recognize that this change is coming as well, they knew this was a big and bold step for Wiley and one that they could get behind. Doesn't mean there aren't ramifications for them just as there are for us, but they are supportive of the direction we're taking. And I think that's really important because I see, we see societies as a really essential component of the scholarly communication system, not just today, but going forward. Jeff talked earlier about the importance of offering researchers the journals that they've long trusted and published in and committed to. And that's very true of the society journals in particular. Now, when Wiley enters, not just Deal, but the other agreements that Ben has talked about earlier, we do so with all of the journals we publish. We don't exclude anything on the grounds of ownership. We don't exclude anything on the grounds of impact. If this transition is going to take place, and if we can reach sustainable agreements, then that transition and that sustainability has to be able to work for all. So that's why everything comes with us when we go to the table. The other significant piece, and, and Gerard has alluded to this, is the amount of work that's needed on the infrastructural side. Now, we've been investing really heavily in infrastructure since 2011, so we could switch on the full gold 
process for deal within a week of signing the contract. We are switching on the hybrid piece on Monday. It is a huge piece of work for Wiley, but also for the Max Planck Digital Library, who've been fundamental and critically important partners in all of this. Our colleagues from Wiley actually are in Munich again today, sitting down working through the finer details of these later stages of implementation with our counterparts at MPDL. There is a really big difference between switching on a gold workflow to going to operate hybrid publishing for 700 institutions across 1600 journals that will probably affect 10,000 researchers over the course of a given year. So that is a really significant piece of lift as well. It's requiring us to focus a huge more amount of energy on our open access infrastructure than ever before. Thanks. And the reason we're doing that is because the most significant group we need to influence here is the researchers, the stakeholders that I, I think we all have in common. We've seen for a long time two kind of opposite ends of the spectrum here. We've got those who are totally committed to open access, won't really consider any other model of publishing, and we have those who are still very anti-open access for, for whatever reasons they hold. It's really that large group in the middle that we now have an opportunity to demonstrate the benefits of open access to. And if we fail to implement well, we're not going to be able to do that very effectively. So our goal here is to get through this deal in a way that makes it significant for the researchers, as well as for those of us sitting in this room discussing these issues today. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Um, Jeff, your perspective on you know, the significance of this agreement on the global scholarly communications landscape. Thanks. <clears throat> I, what I thought I would do for addressing this, the significance is take on some of the questions that I get asked all the time uh, about how transformational agreements might work or might not work and see what answers we get because of the Wiley deal agreement. Um, one of the questions that we get all the time is, will major publishers ever consider flipping to open access via, via transformational contracts? Uh, there's, there are not a small number of people, in fact, maybe even a majority of people in the library community, I think, who believe that we can never win against the big publishers, that the big publishers have too much power and that they just get to dictate their terms to us and we have to bow down and take them. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about this deal, as well as some of the others that we've talked about, but this one being so large and so comprehensive uh, and so uh, cleanly uh, structured, is that it's major evidence that large for-profit publishers believe that publish and read agreements can work and that it's a repudiation of the fear of librarians and the stance of some publishers uh, that they can't work and that we'll never see this transformation occur. Um, in applied math, we talk about this as an existence proof. Uh, the fact that it's happening is a wonderful response to those who think it can't ever happen. And it was really very exciting. We stood up and cheered when the deal was announced because of this, uh, because it's encouraging to skeptical uh, folks who think that we shouldn't be pursuing these types of agreements because they'll never happen and we're just wasting our time. Another question we get is, uh, uh, won't gold open access just lock in the market power of the for-profit publishers rather than giving other journals a better chance to compete? There are folks who think that the last thing we should be doing is signing new, clever, innovative deals with the big four because we don't like the big four. They have too much power as it is and wouldn't we want to do anything other than uh, lock in lock ourselves into a new type of contract with them for the future um i don't agree the fact that the total pay i, I don't agree with a lot of things about that uh, I'll, I'll just hit on one or two the total payment depending on the number of articles the volume of articles means in this case that wiley is going to be competing more aggressively than ever for authors it's completely in Wiley's interest. It always has been, but more than ever now, it's, it's directly in their interest, not just on the getting the article side, but on getting the payments from Germany side, that they get German authors to submit to them. Uh, if authors were instead attracted to alternative open access journals because Wiley wasn't doing a good job or wasn't treating the authors well, Wiley's revenues will go down. There's no lock-in. There is no lock-in here. It's up to the authors now where they submit the articles, and that determines how much money Wiley gets. Uh, so we can expect that the publisher will treat the authors better than ever before, as well as Wiley has been treating its authors. They're going to have a very strong economic incentive to treat them even better now. Uh, and it seems um, highly likely 
uh, that uh, to me that Wiley's using this strategy of aggressively negotiating uh, published and read de deals. We heard uh, Ben talk about the several and how they've really experienced a sea change within Wiley. Um, following the so many Elsevier cancellations uh, as part of their competition in the market. We take this as a very good sign that, as they said, they would rather be in the front of the bus rather than in the back of the bus being driven. They want to lead the industry. Uh, and I think that's a very good sign that a publisher is going to be more responsive to authors and is trying to move the industry forward rather than digging in its heels and holding us back. So I, I think it's very positive. Another question um, uh, we get in, in general, people by we, I mean people who are pushing for transformative agreements, uh, is do you care about your researchers? In this case, does Germany even care about its researchers? Is it only going to cancel deals? There's been so much attention to the German cancellation of its Elsevier deal, of the California cancellation of its Elsevier deal. Uh, this agreement is a very strong statement that we're not just trying to cancel deals, that we're trying to move forward and form new partnerships together with publishers to move into an open access world. And I think it's a very positive statement, the fact that this is a partnership, that there's something in it for both sides, which is exactly what all of us seeking transformation agreements have been trying to achieve. This is, again, a strong statement that we can work together with the publishers to move forward. Uh, it's a very positive thing in that regard. Um, the last thing uh, is a question that we all get, uh, and it's come up already several times in this conference, um, aren't these open access agreements too expensive? What, if, what about people who can't afford them? Isn't this just going to mean more money for the publishers and we're going to be in trouble? Um, I think one of the things that this agreement demonstrates along with some of the others that's quite important uh, to all of us is that just as subscription prices today vary subscriber by subscriber. There is not a list price. We all negotiate and we get different prices. And there are reasons for that. We have different purchasing power. We have different intensity of demand and so forth. And uh, we agree on different prices. What we, the recent publish and read agreements have shown is that we can expect that publish and read prices can vary too. And I think that's a good thing. It means that we can, for instance, look towards cost neutrality, that those who are paying more for their subscriptions now can pay more for publish and read without hurting themselves. It's the same amount of money, but it helps support those who are paying less. Uh, for instance, less funded in, in institutions in the global south who can't pay much for subscriptions also can't pay much for publish and read, but in a world where we can have different prices for publish and read, we see that. So Norway's agreement, for instance, with Elsevier is paying a lot more than Germany is paying to Wiley per article. It's a much higher price per article. Uh, other publish and read agreements are at a lower price per article. We know that some of the pure open access publishers like Copernicus can charge an even lower price than that. That's okay. That's a good thing that we can have that flexibility because it enables us to get through a transition where not everybody can pay the same amount. We can see that the publishers are recognizing and are willing to negotiate and are interested in cost neutrality as a possible way through this transition. As long as they're not losing money, they're not too unhappy. As long as we're not paying more money, we're not too unhappy, and we see this as a good thing. So I, I, this deal seems positive in pretty much every regard to other institutions around the world. People I've been talking to elsewhere are also very excited by this, and we think it's a really positive uh, development. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to try to then contextualize this um, in South Africa. And I, I've brought a quote here from an article entitled Open Access in South Africa, a Case Study and Reflections. You probably know it by uh, Czernowitz and Goudier. Um, and I've just taken a quote here. While sweeping change in the global north will see more northern research freely available to, on, um, to all online, the danger for locals is twofold. Firstly, that they may be limited in their opportunities to publish, especially by expensive APCs. And secondly, that their own research drowns in the worsening invisibility of the online discoverability sphere. So I, I, I thought I would be a little bit, you know, um, put that out there and to ask and ask my panelists to, 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 to say something about that, to comment on this. Um, I, I think I'd indicated that Liz would actually start this. Okay, Liz, do you have a comment? I'll, I'll start this one. Um, this is clearly a particularly important issue here. Um, <laughs> And there are a number of issues raised by APC-based publishing, and, and there are many papers that try to tackle this. Um, I thought it might be helpful to describe a little bit of our own experience. It's not the full answer, but it, it is perhaps indicative of some degree of, of affordability. 
Um, someone in my team decided to take a look at the implications of a larger migration to open access on the global south and ability to pay if more journals became fully open access or in the case of transitional models like this, a greater requirement was placed upon economies that couldn't necessarily afford it to, to pay for APCs as well. This was pushed by two particular things. One was some um, negative research community feedback we had to the flip of an individual journal. Um, and some of you may be aware of that particular case. And the other is because as we enter into more of these transitional agreements, we do anticipate that we will flip more journals faster than we have done in the past. So a greater proportion of our of our publishing becomes full gold. Now, she unfortunately did not anticipate um, that this meeting would be being held and we'd be discussing South Africa in particular. So she looked at Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, uh, Mexico. And those countries, from Wiley's perspective, share some characteristics with South Africa. The rate of hybrid output is practically zero. There is some full gold publishing activity, but the vast majority of what we publish from all of these countries is subscription articles in subscription-based journals. And she looked at the cohort of journals that we'd flipped over a four-year period and looked at the rate of submissions and publications from those countries in those journals in the two years before flip and the two years after flip. And we start charging an APC immediately we flip. There was no downward impact on the number of submissions or the number of publications from those countries. She then looked again at some journals that we flipped in partnership with the full gold publisher Hindawi. And in their case, the number of submissions and publications from those countries actually increased. Now, that is not to say for one minute that APC-based publishing is either a good solution or the only solution or is not part of a mix that might work better in South Africa. I personally agree with, with the point Jeff made earlier. There are some compromises involved with green, but green at the moment is the, the policy put forward within South Africa. Most of the journals we publish will comply with that. And I'm also familiar from my time running a big chunk of the life sciences journals for Wiley that the local publishing activity here in South Africa is really important and there's a great deal of loyalty from researchers to the homegrown publishing program. So the partnerships with African Journals Online and with Cielo, I think are really important in providing that kind of gold standard infrastructure that makes sure that that local research is still very globally discoverable. But what I don't want to do, like Ben, is come here and try to say the solutions that we found for, the, for Europe and are beginning to find perhaps in North America are going to work here. I don't think that's the case. I also respectfully don't think we're quite at the tipping point yet. The pie chart that Ben showed earlier showed we have a long way to go. That means we have time to figure out what might work for South Africa and that's why we're here to begin having that conversation about what might work for this environment. Gerard, if you're still there, and I don't know if you've um, been listening in, do, 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 what comment would you give us? Well, first, um, I've, I've been listening in. I've been listening to the discussion, and um, I, I completely agree with the various remarks that, uh, that Liz and, and Jeff have made. And, and, and just to come back to, to that discussion before, I think really an, an important issue why this deal with Wiley uh, has been made in the end is that I would say Wiley was the first of the major publishers that listened to um, to what the clients, what the customers actually wanted. This was, was what was demanded at the Berlin conference, right? You, Colleen, you you mentioned the the collective demand to 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 the CEOs of the of the major publishers um, at this Berlin conference, and um, and Wiley was the first, in in my respect, to to really understand and listen and 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 it's a it's a true partnership now to um, to try to get this organized and get this going which uh, which is a lot of work from both sides concerning the the for me the, the situation with with south africa and the, and the possibilities there and and um, what would be the best possibilities for them is is very difficult to evaluate one one remark i want to make though is that we were always told and I always thought that um, that the different uh, different countries paid completely different prices for subscription in the past. Um, but I'm not sure at all from the interaction that I had at the last Berlin conference with representatives from South Africa, that South Africa was paying so much less, for instance, for subscriptions than West European countries did. 
And so if you want to see what also the consequences from a change of the system are uh, to in, in this new model where you pay uh, for publication, where you pay APCs, it is very important to also understand what you actually paid um, in the past in relation to what other countries paid in the past that now make this transition. And I think that that should be carefully looked at, but I don't have the numbers at hand. Um, but, but some of these differences might not be as big as, as some people would think they were. Jeff, please. One of the things I think that, uh, that, and Gerard was alluding to this, it's important to recognize is a lot of the resistance to gold open access is resistance to the original model of gold open access, which we refer to as double dipping, where you're paying additional fees on top of still paying a full subscription. Um, that is not what we're talking about with transformational agreements. We're talking about converting money that is already being spent on subscriptions, whatever it is, it may be more or less for various countries, but converting that money into money for publishing. So it's not talking about an increase in the spending. Another concern I've heard a lot, not so much here, so maybe this isn't as much of a worry in South Africa. I haven't heard, I've heard a couple of people refer to this, but not as many. But there's a lot of concern is that the flip that people are talking about, that transformational agreements necessarily mean that the authors are going to be paying the APC. And indeed the model in California that I described earlier that we're proposing does have authors, when they have the funds, pay part of the cost. But that's not the only way to do it. Uh, and indeed the German agreement with Wiley is not that form. The entire fee is being paid by the central government, essentially, by the institutions who are funded by the central government, and the authors aren't paying. So it's not necessary that the individual authors have the funding to do it. If you have institutional funds that are being used currently for subscriptions and you can repurpose those, the authors can be shielded completely if, uh, if you wish. Um, the other thing I, I, I we, they came up in a conversation, a, a tea time conversation, that I think is important to recognize is, and, and the German uh, Wiley agreement illustrates this, this agreement is, was designed to be nationwide for Germany, for all institutions. As much as we respect the amazing research output of Germany and some of its institutions being the very top institutions in the world, not every single university in Germany is a high output producer. This is an alliance, a coalition of high publishing institutions and low publishing institutions, and it's the fact that they're banding together that in part is making this possible. If you put together an institution that has money for subscriptions and an institution that doesn't have money for subscriptions, and the total amount that you send to the publisher for publishing is the same, you can divide that up that the institution that had the money pays its share and the institution that didn't have money doesn't pay as long as the coalition can agree to that. So forming coalitions and working that way where you combine better off and worse off institutions, high publishing and low publishing institutions, and average that out, then you can do that in a way that each institution is no worse off than it was before, and we get open access on top of that. And I think the coalition of all the German institutions actually demonstrates that quite nicely. Thank you. So I had one more question for our panel, but because we are running late, I think I'm going to actually have to put it to the floor, if you guys are comfortable with that. Yeah. Put it to the floor and ask you if, if there are any further questions you would like to pose or comments to make. One more. Okay, my, my, my comment, I'm from UNISA. My comment, it's twofold. It's the, I'll take from the bottom up. It's what Jeff said around repurposing the individual APC funding. I don't know how this model is going to work, the transformative model, model looking at how we publish in South Africa and what's being pushed forward, for example, for researchers. And I have my two DVCs sitting here. They can also attest to that. When it comes to APCs, we publish, uh, we collaborate with the publishing part that you have to collaborate to publish and then, and it's not from one institution, it's two or three institutions that you publish with uh, colleagues from. How will this model then deal with that kind of scenario? The second part is that from the library side and the university side in totality, we get a budget assigned to a library to do certain things. The APCs are, separate and they reside in the research portfolio. If you are a DVC for research and whatever, that's it, but you don't even, as the DVC, it's not your money. It goes to the colleges. And the colleges, the dinner in the colleges decide, which is your faculties, how they're going to accost it. And the figures that you are talking about, 
my colleagues can attest from UNISA, our APCs were looking at 3,000. It's, it's a lot. And you are talking about 2,750, which is almost 45,000 rands per article. And that's what we need to battle with and over above the issue of transforming and talking about open access and the understanding, and you know the narrative around predator publishing that people misconstrue and confuse what's open access to leading to deceptive publishing and so forth. And we're, that's our hurdle at the moment. But I just wanted to highlight those two aspects of co-publishing, how do you actually deal with it? Because for us, it depends with an institution. If I write an article with somebody else, the APC, my institution will have to decide in the dinner side to say, how are we going to pay that APC? Because we also get funding, which is your carrot and stick. If you publish, there's a carrot and stick compared to what you have globally. In South Africa, it's like that just to transform our research landscape. Because I have Gerard on the line, if I might start with Gerard. Did you, were you able to follow Gerard? Do you have a comment? Yes, I, I was able to hear the question very well. I unfortunately couldn't uh, see the person who asked the question, <clears throat> but I'll try to address it as, as good as possible. It's a very important uh, question. Let, let me start with a, with a different statement. Let me start saying that publication, writing a publication, publishing the result of a scientific project is part of a scientific project. So publishing the work is part of a research project. So that's why we, we really have to realize that the cost associated with publishing the work, it's very normal that that is also covered by the same institution or funding agency that, that finances also the research project. And um, so in a way, you, we, we, we could all be amazed a little bit how we did this in the past where we let the readers pay for it. And it's actually the natural way that, that the, the scientists who publish the work as part of their research project pay for that. And then it's either the university or the funding organization or whatever um, who, who pays for that. And so in that sense, you're absolutely right that right now some of the, of the, the APCs are covered out of the research portfolio. They're, they're covered out of the research budget, whereas the library budget is kind of a, a different pot of money that, uh, that the university deals slightly different with. So just as we ask from the publishers to change their business model, um, in a way also the money flow within the university needs to be reorganized. And in a way that money, you, you kind of need an overhead on the research budget to cover the publication cost. Um, and you have to merge that with what you normally spend on subscription fees. So that is the, the library budget. Um, so that, that's the, that was my, my reaction to your second question. The first question in collaborations, it is indeed such that we look in, for instance, in the deal with Wiley, we look who is the corresponding author, right? I mean, an article is only going to be paid once. And, um, and we do it normally such that the corresponding author, often it's the first author, um, but, but not necessarily, um, but that's the one who submits the article, who, who is in contact with the publisher. Um, that person is responsible that the, that the payment is being made. That is to say, in, in this deal with Wiley, that the organization uh, where this person is affiliated to will actually then, then cover the cost. Of course, organizations can can decide to, to, to split it then later in, in a different way. But, but in the calculation with the publisher, that's the way it's done. I hope that that addresses both, both questions. Otherwise, the others can add. Yeah, thank you. My other panelists, do you have anything to add? No, I think that, that was spot answer. on. Okay, yeah. good answer, thank you. Okay, then I think we have to conclude now. Um, we can take one more question. Okay, one more question. Uh, it's, um, question comment uh, to you what you were saying uh, that those deals are not locking um, yeah the money again back with the biggest four or five publishers this morning you were saying 80% of the publishing output actually gets published by those publishers and 20% by the rest it's not the latest number I assume but so far I always heard that just 65% of the library budget goes into <laughs> the big four or five publishers. So in the end, that will even drive more revenue to those big publishers in the future. 
So I don't really get your point where you're saying that is not going to happen. Actually, that's what I'm going to see what's going to happen. Because if you look all at the long tail of publishers, you have this big four and there are 5,000 others. If it takes you three years to negotiate a deal, when are you going to <laughs> end at that long tail? Um, first, I think just a clarification. I didn't, 80% of the publications don't go to the big four, it goes to the 20% uh, of the publishers. Um, so it's, it's, it's an 80-20 rule. So uh, that includes more than just the big four. It's the big four, uh, I think, are responsible for about 55, 60% of the publications, as I recall. So the numbers are not inconsistent with the dollar amounts. Um, I, nothing about, if, if these deals are done right, it doesn't drive more money to the publishers you have these deals with. Um, that really continues to be up to the authors on where they want to submit. Now, they may start choosing to submit to these publishers more because of open access, uh, because they have that open access option, but they're also being asked to put up some of the money, so that might put some pressure in the other direction. What I do think is that it puts pressure on other publishers to then start offering publish and read deals as well, and to if it turns out that authors really like these deals, then we would encourage ACS and RCS and AO, IOP and all the others to sign similar deals to offer the authors the same thing. Uh, the, uh, the point that Gerard made uh, about the publishers listening to what the customers want, and where in this case the authors are a very important part of the customer base, is crucial. But we're definitely trying to not set these up in a way that is going to favor the big publishers. And indeed, I, as I said, any savings we get on subscriptions, any net savings you get on subscriptions, we're planning to pour into other uh, open access publishing in other venues and other publishers. Um, so. Uh, if, if we get that wrong, we're going to immediately backtrack and change it. That's very much not what we want to have accomplished. Yeah, we will see. But I, I don't, if, if, it, if it is just because the authors really like open access so much, then I hope that puts a lot of pressure on you to offer similar deals. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, but I don't see that it is, it, there's nothing about the structure of the contracts that, that locks in a uh, growing stream of money to the publishers. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Last question. I hope, Gerard, you don't mind hanging out a little bit longer. Yes. Hi there. I, I represent one of the 20% publishers. And um, perhaps because we operate in a different market and we have some experience with page charges and article processing charges, we have many instances of authors wishing to split charges um, change who the corresponding author is to get a better deal, um, change who the lead author is. Sometimes you've got to actually consider the ethical situation that, that arises. Um, is that something you guys have had to consider in, in the way you set up your, your, your um, programs? Shall I, shall I take a first go at that? You go ahead. Um, yes, absolutely. And we, we do have authors who try to change uh, corresponding author status. Um, I think the answer to that one really lies in whether the institutions are happy to have the author being switched or the authors being switched between as eligible for their deals or not and representing their institution or not. These are exactly though the kind of details that we spend a lot of time working through with Max Planck right now in terms of the implementation of the deal agreement. The more of these agreements there are globally, the fewer issues there will be. Split payments, I agree, are, are tricky and I'm not talking here about the, the proposal from CDL, I think that is different. But splitting payments between multiple different authors creates a lot of complications with billing and how long it takes people to get payments through and that kind of thing. Um, but yes, there are a lot of challenges, as Gerard said, in going article by article. And as soon as you look at all of the different things around article publication, life gets complicated. It's easy to say these deals cover primary research and review articles. And then if you look at most publishers, you, you try and work out whether they have only two article types called primary research and review. We don't. So what constitutes primary research and review is another complication. The devil is in the detail, and there's an awful lot of it, which is why this close alignment of not just the what you want to do, but how you want to get there, and having that centralized infrastructure and central entities that can help determine the way forward is, is really important. 
Fred, as a scientist, did you want to add anything? No, I, I think uh, Liz addressed um, the, the most critical point. I, I think, I mean, um, or, I mean, when, when, as also was, was indicated, when first authorship changes on a paper, that always um, worries me, but more on difficult grounds, different grounds, right? Ethical grounds, how to, how to scientific integrity grounds. Um, but but the other issues that, that that people change their address also between submission and 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 acceptance of a paper that people move to a different location or move to a different country um, that that of course happens and that's indeed all the details that have been discussed um, how to deal with that but I think it, this this was covered correctly okay great thank you all right and that I think, yes, I think we have to stop. Um, so I thank uh, Gerard Meyer. Thank you very much for finding the time to be with us. Thank you, Liz Ferguson. Thank you, Jeff, again, for your time and contributions. Thank you, audience, um, for your engagement.